What's up, guys? This is Tom. Welcome back to another episode of Your Move, where I analyze chess.com member games for free. Before we jump into the analysis, don't forget to take this opportunity to like this video and also subscribe to my YouTube channel. I really, really appreciate your support. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to review a really nice attacking game today. Sent in to us by chess.com user. The password is 1234. So after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, the Spanish, bishop c4, the Italian, are the most common replies here by white. But instead, white opts for d4, the Scotch game, named after the great country Scotland. After black captures, white's main line in this position is to capture on d4 with the knight. These will, this variation will lead you into the, to the Scotch game proper. But white was... Uh, feeling a little bit more in a fighting mood and instead decided to gambit the pawn and play bishop c4 when this is known as the scotch gambit which can be a very dangerous opening if you're caught unaware after knight f6 which is best white plays the pawn thrust e5 so this is an absolutely critical position and if you are a black player who responds to e4 with e5 you're going to come across positions like this not only in the scotch game as we are now but also in the italian game okay and it's absolutely essential theory essential opening theory for you to know in order to get a playable position out of these openings it's just the reality of it this pawn is like william wallace <laughs> okay he's got his face painted He's running at you screaming with a long sword and he's coming to chop off your king's head. Okay, so you need to do something about it. So, over to you. Black to play in this position. How should black respond to stay in the game? Pause your videos. Okay, so in this position, it is absolutely critical for you to know that when White has played e5, and there's a knight on f6 and a bishop on c4, that the correct move for black to play in his position is d5, this counterattack in the center. With the justification being that if we have these exchanges, black's got this nice intermezzo to get the queens off the board, black ends up a clean pawn up, bishop pair, great center, awesome position. So d5 is a move that you absolutely have to play. Queen e7, I understand why black played this move. Queen e7 is a very common move in the scotch game, in the main lines of the scotch, to deal with this pawn thrust e5. But against the scotch gambit, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And black, as early as move 5, is already... I don't want to say that he's lost, but it ain't looking good. <laughs> the armies are at the gates. White castles in this position. Nice move. Recognizing that if there are exchanges on e5, rook e1, game over, skewer. So he kind of panics a little bit and drops the knight back to g8. And look at this dumpster fire on the king's side. Good luck developing these pieces. The knight's missing the f6 square. The bishop can't move because the queen's in the way. This means that it's going to take an eon to get this rook into the game in the king castle. And... And white it has really smooth development for all of his pieces. So after rook e1, good move, developing the rook on this aggressive e-file where both the queen and king are. Black gets out of dodge. White plays a nice multi-purpose move, queen e2, defending the bishop on c4 and eyeing up the king on the e-file. I really like this move. And then black plays b6. <laughs> You know, we're building up a subscriber base here on MVP Chess, so I know a lot of you know that moves like this are a big no-no on this channel, okay? Black is massively behind the development. You cannot play slow pawn moves like B6 on the side of the board. You just can't do it. And I know it's well-intentioned. Black's probably thinking, I need to play Bishop B7 and Castle Queen side, but look how White's able to take advantage of this slow play. So I want to turn it over to you for the next two moves, okay? Here's move number one, white to play. Basically, all white needs to do is to develop his queen side. 
If he can do that, he's got an absolutely raging attack that will play itself. So what did White play in this position to accelerate his queen side development? Pause your videos. So White played in this position the very thematic move, c3. Okay, with the idea being that if we have dc, knight takes c3, bishops coming to e3 with tempo, rook ad1, enough said. So I really like White's decision to, to play c3 here. And I think Black correctly ignores that but plays bishop b7. Okay, so let's stop here. This is actually a really critical position. Believe it or not, if Black can manage to castle to the queen side, the king would be reasonably safe over there. And that will buy Black some time to sort out this quagmire on the king's side. And don't forget, Black is a clean pawn up here. Okay, so Black would certainly have decent chances in a position like this. So it's up to you as the white player. You've played a great game so far. You've built up a great initiative. How do you keep it? How do you cut across Black's plan of castling to the queen side? Pause your video. So White recognized this, loaded up the trebuchet, and launched a fireball that breached Black's fortification. Bishop takes f7, boom! Awesome move, awesome move. The king is denied the ability to castle to the queen side. The nice thing about this move, bishop takes f7, and it highlights one of the drawbacks of bringing the bishop to b7, is now white can play e6. And if black captures, queen takes e6 is checkmate. Notice if the bishop were still on c8, the e6 square would be defended and this move wouldn't be possible. So bringing the, bringing the bishop off this diagonal made white tack even stronger. So Black sidesteps this. He's like, I don't want my, I can't take on f7. I don't want my king out in the open, understandable. So, <coughs> excuse me, after bishop g5, bishop e7, white showed really phenomenal total board awareness in this position. So I want you to pause your videos. What did white play in this position? while I take a sip of water. I've been battling the flu all week. <laughs> okay, it's really natural for our attention to focus on this quadrant of the board. It's only natural. We got our bishop here on f7. We got this tension between the dark square bishops. We have... Uh, attacking ideas around the pawn move e6. But white notices, hey, all the way on the other side of the board, this queen is critically short on squares and found a really nice move b4. Really nice total board vision by white. Really, really impressed by this move that he was able to, to step back, not be hyper-focused on the the king side initiative he had and find a move like this b4 so black's forced to give up the piece and after knight b knight bd2 the rest is a matter of technique so white is up a clean piece so we're going to flip through the rest of the game rather quickly however there are a few instructive moments that i wanted to touch on along the way so we have some exchanges white's trying to open things up and attack on the on the light squares, that's understandable. Looks like black is trying to sort out his, his queen side, maybe get this bishop to d7 so he can find some shelter for, for his king. White centralizes his pieces, captures. And then I just wanna pause here, okay? And I'm gonna turn it over to you. And I'm just gonna ask a binary question here. I'm not gonna ask you to find the best move specifically, but what would you do with white in this position? Notice there are tension, there's tension between the queens here. Do you exchange here with white? Do you exchange queens? Or do you keep queens on the board? Have a think about this, pause your videos. 
So this is something I talk to my students about a lot. You know, I think a lot of us early in our chess development were taught, if you're up material, just exchange pieces. That's generally true, but what I like to teach my students and what I try to practice in my own games is I make decisions about queen exchanges based on the relative safety of the kings, okay? So I'm white in this position. My king is so much safer than black's king. So it's in my best interest, obviously, to keep this attacking piece on the board. If these queens are exchanged, exchanged, Black's king in the center of the board makes a little bit more space. He's under less, less pressure. And don't forget, Black also has this potentially annoying 4v1 majority on the queen side that I think becomes much stronger if the queens come off the board because then Black will be freer to start pushing these pawns. Whereas if the queens are on the board, that would be suicidal. So I really like White's decision here to play queen e2. So I wanted to stop at that point of the game, just to point that out. Really nice decision by White, keeping the queens on the board. Black's king tries to find shelter, and White starts taking control over the light scores and trying to open more lines on the king's side. So good play by, by White. King b8, knight g3. And after knight, e5, knight f5, rook e8, let's pause here. White is winning pretty much every which way in this position, okay? But as Frank Marshall famously said, the hardest game to win is a one game. And this is definitely a one game for White. But what is the easiest way to convert this advantage? White found it in the game. Pause your video, see if you can find the correct continuation. So Black just challenged us on the, on the E file. You might be inclined to move your queen, but White found the correct continuation, in my opinion. Queen takes e8. Nice job by White. And we get this position. Psychologically, it can be difficult sometimes to, to play without your queen, but White's just got so much firepower here. Two rooks, two minor pieces for the queen. All White really needs to keep tabs on is the potential counterplay of this d4 pawn. But White does a really nice job, not so much of preventing this pawn's advance as he does with just pure concrete calculation, which was really impressive. So after d3, okay, this is Black's only chance in the positions to advance his past pawn. We have bishop c8 forcing the king out and a really nice move, rook a d5, really boxing the Black king in. And after d2, White found a really nice checkmating sequence. So I'm gonna pause it here, over to you. It's mate in two moves. What did White play in this position? Pause your videos. So nice job by White realizing he didn't need to move the rook from e1. He found the nice move knight e7, boom. And after king d6, Rook d5 is checkmate. A really nice checkmate in the middle of the board with, with the two rooks supported by the minor pieces. So really nice attacking game by White. I think White showed some really nice attacking ideas like when Black was on the verge of castling to the queen side, recognizing that playing bishop takes f7, boom, to keep the initiative. And I also really liked his decision to play c3 to accelerate his, his queen side development. But for Black... And all you other e4, e5 players out here, d5, absolutely essential opening theory, not only in the Scotch Gambit, but also in many variations of the Italian game where you see a quick d4 to, to stay in the game. You just absolutely need to know this know this move d5. So I hope, I hope that you learned something and that you're able to use this knowledge in, in your own games. So thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the analysis. And if you haven't done so, please do like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I really appreciate your support. And if you're interested in private chess lessons by yours truly, please visit my website, mvpchess.com. You can also get there by scanning the QR code below. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time on your move. Bye.